All righty. Let's meet our panel. Uh, he is director of the OHSU uh, Knight Cancer Institute. You all know him for his role in developing life-saving cancer drugs like Gleevec, I think was a character on Star Trek. Isn't that correct? Yeah. And, uh, and uh, launching the field of precision medicine. Many remember him going tattoo to tattoo with Gert Boyle. Gert, how you doing over there, babes? There's Gert over there. Uh, during the Knight Cancer Challenge, please welcome Brian Drucker. Brian, come on up here. Thank you very much. He is the CEO of Cancer Research UK. He is a chemical engineer with a Harvard MBA, and he spent several years leading the healthcare organizations and was knighted for his influential work in preventing and treating cancer. Getting knighted. You're the only guy here getting knighted. Come on up here. Come on up here. Uh, Apel Kumar. Good to see you. Good to see you, Brian. All right. And he is director of the Canary Center for Cancer Early Detection at Stanford University. Uh, he also chairs the Department of Radiology at Stanford School of Medicine. He specializes in nuclear medicine and molecular imaging, and his lab focuses on the biology of cancer and how we can detect and treat cancer early through uh, imaging, gene therapy, and other techniques. Please welcome Sam Gambier. Sam, come on up. Good to see you, Sam. Have a seat, gentlemen. Gee, who's the dumb one on this panel, huh? Just, it's like the day in high school I had my picture taken with the chess club. <laughs> well, it's an honor to be among you. Let's start with Brian. Congratulations on all your work, especially with this, this Gleevec drug. Tell people what it, what it does. Well, what we did with Gleevec is we understood what drove the growth of a cancer, and we developed a drug in collaboration with the drug company to shut down that abnormality specifically. And in our clinical trials, we had virtually a 100% success rate. It worked, it had minimal toxicity, and it was a pill. So we had a pill that targeted the cancer without harming normal cells, and it worked incredibly well and continues to work well for patients now 15, 16 years later. I mean, I know you're a modest guy, but it's a true breakthrough drug, isn't it? It really is. I think we often use the term breakthrough a little bit too loosely. This, I would admit, It's like was, show business. Yeah, We're all geniuses, right, right. but in this case, it's true. <laughs> Yes, yes, it was, yes. yes, thank you. Okay. Now, there you are. And, and actually, Jay, if I may, one of our star patients here tonight um, shares a birthday with our governor, so I'd like to wish Rob Schick, who many of you know in our foundation, um, 10 years on Gleevec, still doing great. Happy birthday, Rob. Now, we have a lot of scientists in the room, but for those of us who are not scientists here. Explain why you're all gathered here this week. So, um, to have a lot of fun, is, lot the, of fun. is the first reason. But no, it's, it's, to, it's to really bring together the area of researchers around the world that have focused on early cancer detection. As was said earlier, a lot of people are doing great cancer research, but very few people have been focusing on the front end of the problem how to assess the risk of cancer, how to prevent cancer, and how to detect it early. So this symposium is unique in that it really focuses on that part of the cancer equation, and we think that's a game changer for years to come. Now, Harpal, I heard you give a statistic I thought was pretty amazing a while back. There are now more people, there are as many people surviving cancer as dying from it. I explain why that's such an amazing statistic. No, it is. It's, it's, it's the first time in history, really, that we've been able to say that if, if we look across all types of cancer, then actually, and the, and the measure we use uh, increasingly is, is the proportion of people who are still alive 10 years after a diagnosis, which, you know, isn't quite a cure, but it's the nearest metric we have to right. a cure. And, you know, for the first time, we're able to say that more than half of people are reaching that point, and it's been a function of the array of successes we've seen from, from the development of drugs like, like Gleevec to what we've been able to do with screening programs and a whole range of, of other advances that we've seen really predominantly over the last two or three decades, actually. We, the, the transformation started in about 1990. It's, it's really from that point onwards that we've started to see a very steep decline in mortality rates. Now, Brian, when did you team up with the UK on this project? It's been, what, two years now? Um, after we announced the Night Cancer Challenge, we 
We announced we were focusing on early detection, as you heard from Harple. Cancer Research UK also has a focus on early detection. And we both were speaking the same language, that is an underrepresented area, that outside of a few experts like Sam Gambier, whose work is just spectacular, there wasn't enough of it and there wasn't enough funding, and we pledged that we would work together on this problem. Now, Sam, you said something once I thought was pretty amazing. How many people in this room? Let's, let's say 200, 250? I think that's probably about right. How many, have, how many have cancer and don't know it yet? So, well, so the question depends a little bit on subtleties, but probably at least one out of every three people. One of every three. Yeah, but whether that cancer is going to go on to hurt that person is right. a different story. But your whole thing, and I found this fascinating, was early detection. I mean, so early, even the cells barely know that they have cancer, right? I mean, you're, you're yeah. literally, uh, you talked about a few rogue cells. We have billions of cells, but you talk about, it just takes a few rogue cells, doesn't it? Yeah, so, you know, unfortunately, we can't look inside each and every one of us on a cell-by-cell -cell basis. But if we could, probably there would be in all of us um, early signs. And I think the bigger challenge for us is not just finding whether we have cancer early, but finding those cancers that will go on to hurt you. There may be many cancers that you won't need to have intervention on. So the challenge isn't just about diagnosing them, but challenges about what we call prognosis, right. figuring out the ones that are the nasty ones that you have to do but something about. But you talked about as a people, we don't really concentrate on a problem until after we have it. Yeah. If you concentrated on the problem before you got it, you could probably avoid the whole thing, pretty much. Yeah, and you can even fast forward beyond that. You could imagine a time where at the time of conception, you know what you're at risk for. At the time of birth, you're further knowledgeable about what you're at risk for. And then you're being screened very early on through your whole life for things we know that you're at risk for, including certain cancers. And that would change the paradigm of detecting things early. Yeah, Brian, you and I were talking earlier about this. Now, Angelina Jolie sadly has this very uh, horrible strain of, of, of cancer that it seems to permeate her entire family. And you were saying that we could take genes from someone who has, explain what. Well, so the way that that gene was discovered, this is BRCA1, BRCA2, breast cancer susceptibility gene, is there were women who had a very, very high rate of getting breast cancer in the lifetime, 70, 80%, and a group led by Mary Claire King uh, ultimately identified the gene that caused that susceptibility. Angelina Jolie had that in her family. She opted for double mastectomy and removal of ovaries. But we know that there's still 20 or 30% of women with that gene who don't get cancer. And so we can now begin to flip that question and say, why don't those women get cancer? And maybe there's something in their genetics that's protective that might actually be developed into a treatment to prevent the cancer in the first place. And wouldn't that be a good thing? Yeah. So it's really, it's really studying the outliers, the things that are unusual that actually can lead to advances in knowledge. What keeps you going on this? I mean, obviously this be, must be an extremely frustrating process, dealing with government agencies and, you know, going through trials and putting all your effort into something and it takes 18 months. I mean, what, did you always want to do this as a child? Is it something you always wanted to be a doctor or a, or a scientist? No, I, I, I mean, I, so, so uh, you know, when I, when I was a child, um, you know, I, I came from a family where uh, my parents were refugees. Um, no one in my family had ever been to university before. So I couldn't have dreamed of doing the sort of work I'm doing now. Um, you know, it, it's, it's a vast uh, distance from, from where I started out. But, you know, but in answer to your question, what keeps me going, actually the thing that keeps me going is the fantastic progress we're seeing now. And it's, it really is remarkable that almost no week goes by where something really exciting isn't happening. And... You know, and that's a fan it's a fantastic time to be doing what we're doing in this field. It's a terribly devastating disease, as everyone in this room will know. But the, the rate of progress we're seeing now is unprecedented. And, you know, and, and whether it's the next five years or the next 10 years or the next 20 years, we are seeing lives being transformed. You know, as little as, as, little as 10 years ago, if you'd said to someone, we can treat advanced melanomas, they would have laughed at you. 
but now we can treat advanced melanomas. You know, and, and this is the sort of thing that's happening on a weekly, monthly, yearly basis now. It's, it's a great, exciting time to be doing what we're doing. Sam, I want to ask you, I, I, I saw you speak once, and you spoke about putting these alien spies in people's bodies that go through this, go through. I, I mean, it's a simple analogy, but it's very effective. I, explain what you were talking about. Yeah, so that's a, a technique in which we've thought for years that the best way to detect disease early would be to have molecules or molecular spies that go into your body and then do a house-to-house -house search or a cell-to-cell -cell search. And the concept's not that very different than if you were an alien on another planet and you were trying to study the planet Earth, you could only do so much by taking photographs from the, the sky. Eventually, you'd figure out the way you figure out what really goes on on the planet is by beaming aliens down that are disguised as spies, blend in, and can really study that system. So that's how we're approaching early detection. We send little molecular spies that go into your body and they look around for disease. When they see it, they send a signal back out of your body that we can then detect. Yeah. This sounds like something Dick Cheney could get behind. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> now, Brian, you just competed. It's the Night Cancer Challenge. You matched Phil and Penny Knight's a $500 million gift in less than two years, yielding $1 billion for cancer research. Now, <clears throat> $1 billion. Now, besides the beautiful vacation home we built in Barbados, <laughs> what, what do you, what, tell me how you're going to use those funds. That's pretty impressive. Well, first of all, it, it was just a remarkable period of time to think about how that was raised and how Oregon just stepped up and made it their cause. And so thank you to everybody who's, who's donated. It was just incredible. <laughs> and, and obviously a huge team effort by OHSU Foundation and everybody, all my team who contributed and even my wife who did a lot of speech writing for me. Um, and some of you liked my speeches. Uh, but. The, the primary thing we're going to do with those funds is we're dedicating nearly over half of them to early detection of cancer. And that was what helped recruit Sadiq Esner, who's going to help us build this team, 20 to 30 researchers, trying to free them from having to spend all their time writing grants, getting them to focus on solving a problem. And again, that's a, a language that both Harpo and I speak, which, and they've launched something they've called Grand Challenges, which is how do you solve a bottleneck by getting a team of researchers to work on a problem and solve it and advance the field as quickly as you can. That's what we're trying to do, is build a team, solve a problem, advance the field. Let me ask you a question, whichever three of you jumps in on this one. Obviously, cancer affects everyone worldwide, yet it seems to be the United States and Great Britain. Where is Asia? Where is Germany? I don't see a lot of studies or things coming out of this part, why, why is it? Why does it seem to be mostly the United States and, uh, and Great Britain? Well, I mean, to be fair, there are, there are significant research teams in many countries in the world. We have people here, as you heard earlier, from the Netherlands, from Germany, from, from many other countries who are doing profoundly important work. I think, I think what's different about the US and UK, uh, and, and I'll speak for the UK and others can speak for the US, is you know, there's always been a very rich heritage in medical research, and it's always been something that actually Britain's been very good at, and therefore has invested in very heavily. And, you know, and we have a, a strong tradition of wanting to spend money on science, actually. And, you know, and there's, a, there's a strong belief that science can make the world a better place, and, and we absolutely believe in that. Yeah, yeah, okay. So what do you see happening in 10 years, Sam? Where do you see cancer research going? I think it's a very bright future for cancer research. I think we're going to see a lot of things that are going to be different in terms of how your home will work. Just like the refrigerator analogy you used, we are developing things like smart toilets that are and there. What does a smart toilet do exactly? <laughs> so well, it does a lot of things, but one of the things it does is it senses the things coming out in your stool and in your urine every day time you go take a dump and you pee. Yeah, yeah, so. okay. Sometimes so. the future doesn't <laughs> seem that exciting, you know? Just 
So, Somehow, yeah. So, I could, so every time I would, I would use the bathroom, I would get a written report. No, no, <laughs> not, not, not quite that. You, you'd, you'd, get a, <laughs> you'd, get but, but, you'd get graded, Jay. Yeah, you, yeah, you, get, you think go. About, think about this. It's important because yeah. you don't want to have people have to change their behavior. It's different if I have to have you go take a blood test once a year right. or go do a colonoscopy. But if I can have you do the things you would normally do, like go to the smart toilet and right. monitor you in the background, I have a chance of changing how we can intercept that disease. Okay. So we see a lot of things happening in your home. Now, will it flush before I'm finished? I mean, because um, sometimes, say, you're done, pal. No, I gotta, no, I'm not finished. I mean, that. Well, I'll ask you a better question. Yeah. How do you think it knows it's you? How, how does it know, uh, how does it know I think, it's, I think it's one of your spies. Uh, no, you're, you're close. Everything in your body is unique, like your fingerprints, but there's one other thing that's unique. I don't even want to go there. <laughs> okay, we'll take it offline. Uh, okay. No, no, no. No. I'm, not, I'm not sure I want to know that. What, Jay, Jay, you can get the premium version, don't worry. <laughs> Do you think in our lifetime, cancer will be like polio? Or it's something people the, the, used to get? The analogy I've used is, is an infectious disease analogy, and it's not just about whether we eradicate cancer in its entirety. It's, we haven't eliminated all infections, but we treat some with antibiotics, that's targeted therapy. We treat others, prevent them with vaccines, that's immune therapies, which are coming along beautifully. And the other thing we've done is we, we actually have wastewater treatment facilities and refrigerators, so we have safe food and water supplies, that's prevention. Right. So it's all these things that can make cancer not fear. But I don't think we'll eradicate it entirely. Okay. But if it's to the point where, I have cancer, what do I need to do? Okay, no big deal. And that's it. That's where we want to get to. Well, tell us about the mission of the Cancer Research UK. Tell us exactly what, you, what, what this is and what you're doing. Yeah, so I mean, I, t I touched on a bit of this earlier, really. I mean, we, we, the, w the way we think about our mission is, is we want to reduce the number of people who die from cancer. You know, it's a, at one level, it's a very simple mission. At another level, it, it encompasses a broad range of activity that starts from how we can reduce the number of people who get cancer in the first place. You know, and certainly in the UK, we estimate that over 40% of all cancers are caused by aspects of our lifestyle that we could do something about all the way through to how we can diagnose it better earlier, how we can treat it. And, and, and we do research that covers that entire spectrum of activity. And, and you know, with the, with the ultimate metric of we want to see fewer people die from cancer. You and I talked on the plan about collaborations. Uh, explain what, you, what you're saying. As we think about collaboration, we want to be able to share what we're doing with other people and not duplicate our efforts and ensure that we're making progress as quickly as we can. It, it makes no sense for Harple to spend half a billion dollars on early detection, for us to spend a half a billion dollars on early detection and do the same thing. If we collaborate and we ensure that we're synergizing, that we're solving a problem together, we can make progress so much more quickly. And that's what the Vice President is talking about. That's what drives him crazy when he hears people, you're all doing the same thing. Why don't you work together and designate a center of excellence here and a center of excellence there and work together and solve problems more quickly? I heard you talk once about it's research, not just search, it's research. Ex explain, explain what you meant. Yeah, so this is something I tell all my students that um, one of the most important things you can do as a mentor is you're a coach to them to help them not get frustrated. There's a good reason the term re is in research. It's not called search, it's called research. And that's because you have to iterate. You have to go back and back and back and back. And you have to be very patient because the public expects a lot of quick wins. But in most research, the things that you see that are in the hospital today or that will be the ways to detect cancer early in a decade will have taken 20, 30 years of research. So it's very important we as a public society invest for the long term and we teach our students 
not to get frustrated by quick answers. In biology, the answers take many decades, and that's why it's research and not search. The three of you, what is the most frustrating part of this? Is it the, is it the FDA? Is it the paperwork? Is it, I mean, what, what do you find, what, what, part, what part of it do you hate the most? Gosh, that's a, um, I wouldn't, you know, it's, it's hard to say that there's one part that I would hate the most. I, yeah, I mean, I, there are aspects of bureaucracy that, that get in the way. There are aspects of, um, you know, let's take an example that, that the vice president talks about in the video. You know, it's actually very difficult to share data. And, um, and we would all love to share data with each other and, 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 and work. But, but, you know, there are, there are very, very strict governance rules in place that prevent us doing so as much as we would like to. Now, is that uh, like Homeland Security doesn't talk to the FBI, FBI doesn't talk to local police? I mean, did that kind of thing not communicate? Well, I think... Uh, I mean, it's not for me to say, but I think in some cases they don't want to talk to each other. Where yeah. actually, we do want to talk to each other. We do want to share the data because we know that we'll make faster progress by doing so, actually. But there are things that get in the way of that. Brian? I mean, for me, the frustrating part is just that we don't, as exciting as the times are, and as fast as we're making progress, that we're not making progress faster. And so I'll get an email at least every day from somebody who needs something, and I don't have what they need. It's just not available to them. And so whatever we can do to accelerate progress, because ultimately we want to save more lives. And the fact that we can't do it right now is frustrating to me. Sam, what do you think? Yeah, so I would agree with both those comments. I would add that probably the, the other thing that's most frustrating uh, for many of us is that um, it's a very complex machine that we're dealing with. You can build all kinds of great technologies, but our fundamental understanding of the underlying biology of a cell, of how a cell talks with another cell, of all the cells in our body, is gonna take a lot more time than any of us have ever estimated. We are in for more and more surprises as to just how complex the human machine is as I always say, we're, I think, way ahead on the technology, and the biology is not there yet. And to solve the problem of early detection, we need a lot more investments in understanding the biology. I would think the most frustrating part is having a stupid comedian ask you these questions who doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> but gentlemen, I must say, I, I, I feel good about the future because we have you three gentlemen here, and if it's going to move quickly at all, it's because of you gentlemen. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, thank thank you very you so much. much Brian, thank, thank you. you. Well, right, thank you very much, sir. Thank you, guys. Thanks, everybody.